justify prove to be right or reasonable justification is at the heart of all legal and political argument but at a time when argument itself is slave to appearances it is time to bring back a culture of justification justify a podcast on law and politics in india from the vidhi center for legal policy hosted by orgo sen gupta Welcome to Justify. This is our Republic Day special with an extremely special guest, Justice Ruma Pal, one of the finest judges of the Indian Supreme Court. Our episode today is titled Women and the Republic. And in this episode, we look at Justice Ruma Pal's journey from Nagpur Law College to Oxford and finally to the Supreme Court of India. We discuss issues of relevance to women, why are there so few women in the legal profession, even fewer women in the courts, and also matters relating to judicial reforms. Because just because we have a woman who we are discussing matters with doesn't mean that we are only going to discuss issues specific to women. Judicial reforms issues concern us all and the disproportionate impact whenever something concerns us all is on minorities including women so that's going to be in our tete a tete a little later but like every other episode let's start with our round up of cases from the last week in this case maybe the last fortnight The most important case in the last fortnight as many of you would have heard is the case of Anuradha Bhasin versus the Union of India which relates to the internet shutdown in Kashmir. This seems to be yet another case where the Supreme Court seemed to have talked the talk but not walked the walk because it said all the right things in expounding the constitutional principles but inexplicably refused to provide relief. Let's see why that happened. We all know the facts in this case that on the 4th of August 2019, mobile phone networks, internet services and landline connectivity was disconnected in the state of Jammu and Kashmir. Restrictions on movement were also imposed in several areas and then the nullification of Article 370 followed. The simple question before the court was whether the prohibition on accessing the internet for such a prolonged period of time was valid. There were several other critical issues in this case, one of which was that we were in what the court calls a peculiar situation because the suspension orders of the internet as well as under section 144 of the CRPC restricting assembly of individuals were not produced before the court. When asked, the government said that it just doesn't have the orders. Uh, the court, of course, rightly and this is a bit of a platitude said that the orders would have to be produced but it would seem to me that the moment we are down this path of secret orders being issued on the basis of which certain actions are being carried out that we are no longer a rule of law state i think while the court was right in chastising the government for not being able to produce the orders it should have gone further if the orders can't be produced they can't be law and i think on that ground alone the section 144 imposition and the internet shutdown should have been struck down but unfortunately it was not one can only hope that with the chastising of the court in the future governments will at least be able to produce the orders in terms of the substantive constitutional issue the court placed the proportionality doctrine at the heart and center of its judgment. It said that several instances in the past, the court has recognized that freedom of speech and expression includes the freedom to speak in a certain medium. That includes the internet in today's day and age because a lot of speech and expression and a lot of trade and commerce happens on the internet. So the court recognized and said so boldly that everyone has a right to free speech on the internet and everyone has a right to engage in trade and commerce on the internet. However, it inexplicably said that no one has a right to access the internet in the first place because that was not argued before it. 
while this may be a technicality, it would seem to me that if you are recognizing a right to speak freely on the internet, that presumes that you have a right to access the internet. Because if you don't have a right to access the internet, you really don't have a right to speak freely on the internet. So that, I think, is a distinction without a difference. In terms of the actual restriction, the court went into the proportionality doctrine again. In my view, it didn't break any new ground from the proportionality doctrine as was laid down in the Puttaswamy judgment in the right to privacy case. It said that it would, any restriction on any fundamental right would have to be by a valid law. It would have to be necessary from the point of view of there being no less infringing way of achieving the same measure and it would have to be proportionate. On this basis, it made us few observations which will be extremely important going forward. It said indefinite internet shutdowns are not permissible. It said indefinite repetition of section 144 orders extending them is not permissible. However, as far as applying the law to the facts is concerned, it said that the review committees that had been set up would have to go into the issue and take a decision as to whether the internet shutdown in Kashmir should continue. One can hope for a good decision from the review committee following the spirit of the judgment, but one can only wish that the court went further and did the task of the review committee itself by striking the orders down. Five months, in my view, of shutting down the internet is indefinite. <laughs> It was a busy week for constitutional law in the court. In the case of Muhammad Rafiq versus Kontai Rahmania Madrasa, an important issue of minority rights was decided by the court. The question before the court in this case was whether the state of West Bengal by statute could appoint teachers to a madrasa. And the legal question that arose is whether the right of minority institutions under Article 30 is absolute if it is not absolute, what are the permissible restrictions? And is the appointment of qualified teachers to minority institutions permissible by law? The court said that while the right is framed in absolute terms, any restriction that is for the excellence of the institution would be permissible. Question then arose as to what would be a restriction for the excellence of the institution. Now, Broadly speaking, the court seems to be of the view that when the restrictions are dealing with matters that are of a secular nature, then the state by law is permitted to intervene. However, if a minority institution itself has reasonable grounds to differ from the view taken by the state, it can take a different view. So in this case, while it held the sections of the West Bengal law to be constitutional, saying that since this was appointment of teachers and the state was appointing qualified teachers, that the state would be allowed to do so. But in what I think is constructive reading of the statute, it said that if the state had made an error, which it understood as the minority institution having a better candidate than the one that the state had nominated, then in that case, the minority institution could disagree. However, it really didn't answer, or at least I didn't see an answer, to the million dollar question, which is what happens in the case of a disagreement? Whose word is law? This is an issue on which I don't think we've heard the last word on. Moving on to another interesting case on tribunalization, the case of Balakrishna Ram versus the Union of India. This was a case relating to the Armed Forces Tribunal. The technical issue was whether a letters patent appeal, which is an appeal that is within the high court from a single judge to a division bench, would also be transferred to the Armed Forces Tribunal as per the Act. I'm not going to go into the technicalities of this, which may or may not be of interest please feel free to read up the judgment uh, but the court held in this case that any pending letters patent appeals would continue to go to a division bench of the high court and would not be transferred out to the armed forces tribunal the reason it said that is despite the fact that the armed forces tribunal is a specialized body it found 
that the high court is a constitutional court whose jurisdiction is not ousted completely by the armed forces tribunal this is yet another blow to tribunalization and yet another sign that perhaps we should really rethink tribunals and rather empower our high courts and equip them so that they can take judgments of this kind Moving on to another judgment of the Supreme Court by the same bench of Justices Deepak Gupta and Anirudh Bose, and this is really a remarkable judgment on the National Commission for Protection of Child Rights versus Dr. Rajesh Kumar. In this case, the question was a jurisdictional issue between the National Commission for Protection of Child Rights and the West Bengal State Commission for Protection of Child Rights. You'd wish that the politics that has engulfed our polity would at least leave child rights alone but that would really be wishful thinking in this case rajesh kumar who was then the additional director general of police in west bengal was subject to proceedings both by the west bengal commission and at the same time the national commission asked for some information he said that the national commission has no jurisdiction in the matter the court disagreed the court said that both the national commission and the state commission have to work in the best interests of the child so while the state commission does have the legal authority to inquire into issues within its jurisdiction the national commission is at the same time allowed to ask questions of what the court calls a larger nature and this is something that it cannot be ousted from doing so this is a commonsensical judgment that let's not take jurisdictional pleas as government servants when the question at stake is one of child rights they said that rajesh kumar should have complied with both authorities finally another case of government servants this one from the high court a truly remarkable judgment from the tripura high court and the chief justice akhil qureshi the question in this case was whether a government employee who had attended a political rally and had posted a facebook post which seemed to be critical of a political leader could be denied post retiral benefits the post retiral benefits of this person were denied 5 days before her retirement in a carefully reasoned judgment justice qureshi held that first there is a difference between attending a political rally and participating in a political rally anyone a curious student a bystander and the government servant in this case could attend a rally that's within the fundamental right of freedom of assembly that is not the same thing as participating in a rally which could be a legitimate ground for refusing post retiral benefits similarly as far as the facebook post is concerned there was nothing on facts to show that this was something that was anything beyond the realm of acceptable speech that is protected under the constitution it directed that the post retiral benefits be restored to the individual within 2 weeks time it's a fantastic judgment to show that despite the fact of the illiberality we see all around us the courts can and sometimes do provide relief and more often than not it's the high courts of the country since this is a republic day special our deep dive is on seven reforms for the courts at 70 Today is the 70th year of the Indian Republic and at this point of time both Justice Ruma Pal and I thought that the courts require seven reforms so here they are first reduce hierarchy it is difficult to accept the phrase higher judiciary the word higher itself connotes a hierarchy so when one talks about the higher judiciary is one talking about the inter court or intra court setup there is really no distinction in the nature of duties discharged by any judge at whichever level often artificial distinctions are made intra court particularly with the office of the chief justice no such distinction exists in the constitution at the same time by calling the district courts and magistracy the lower judiciary grave disservice is done to their role and importance in justice delivery 
use of terminology such as this steeped in hierarchy should be discontinued. After all, the courts, more than any other institution, will be well aware of the expressive power of language. 2. Appoint more district judges to the High Court and the Supreme Court. Feelings of hierarchy are also present in the matter of appointments. Appointment of judges is often made on the basis of seniority in age, irrespective of the ability and competence of the appointee. This rule operates particularly harshly as far as the district judiciary is concerned. District judges come to their service with degrees in law and postgraduate degrees. They are often men and women with excellent intellect. They gather their experience as judges over the years and yet their elevation as judges in the high court is deferred because of the fixed percentage of appointees to the high court from the district judiciary. Usually it's around 30%. I think we need more district judges to the high court and the Supreme Court being appointed. Number three, make appointments on merit. The entire system of appointments to the higher judiciary requires reform, influenced as it is, with considerations of regional representation, caste and religious considerations, which, though important, should really not be determinative factors in appointment. Ideally, appointment of judges to the Supreme Court and High Courts should be through an appointments board. It should have the Chief Justice, two senior most judges, as well as representatives of the executive. The entire process would be speeded up by having the executive as part of this body, giving it a skin in the game and allowing it to be held accountable for the choices it makes rather than sitting on files for a long period of time as it happens currently. 4. Appoint more women. Equally important are considerations of gender to see that an adequate number of women are represented on the bench. It is a pity that despite such large numbers of women in law colleges, very few join the legal profession. More women judges and lawyers are needed to encourage more women to enter the legal profession. But more importantly, they are needed to affirm the principle that the ability to be a good judge has nothing to do with one's gender. Unfortunately, today, it appears that the reverse is true. Number five, create a disciplinary mechanism for errant judges. An egregious failure of the Supreme Court and High Courts has been in dithering to take disciplinary action against fellow colleagues. The hesitation is markedly in comparison with action taken by them against judges in the lower rungs of the judicial ladder for much lesser offences. I do think it's time to think about a judicial accountability legislation or better still, an internal code of ethics that is actionable, enforceable and taken seriously. This is something for the Chief Justice of India to initiate. Number six, establish a permanent constitution division of the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court today performs three dis distinct functions. It hears matters for admission, it adjudicates on questions of law as an appellate body, and it lays down law in matters of constitutional importance. Given that the volume of the first two categories of cases is significantly higher than the third, resolution of constitutional disputes, be it Ayodhya, Aadhaar, Shabribala, Article 370, often languishes for long periods. For the some disputes, such as adjudicating on the constitutionality of the breakup of Andhra Pradesh, are delayed so unconscionably that it appears that the court is faced with a fait accompli. Andhra Pradesh was dissolved more than half a decade back. Can the court really set the clock back and say that the formation of Telangana was unconstitutional today? I very much doubt so. It is necessary for the Supreme Court to set up a permanent constitution division so that it can hear constitutional matters expeditiously. This will ensure that egregious delays are not perpetuated in matters critical to Indian democracy. 7. Create a mission to reduce judicial delays. Justice Paul and I both believe that the motto of the Indian judicial system as it turns 70 ought to be Jaldi, justice, access, and lowering delays in India. This requires a multi-pronged 10-year mission with all stakeholders, successive chief justices of India, judges, governments, state and union, lawyers, registry staff, researchers, and academics working in concert to ensure quicker access to justice 
for litigants. If there is one reform that India needs at 70, let this be that reform. Welcome to Tete Tete. My very special guest today is Justice Huma Pal, former judge of the Supreme Court of India and a living legend for many of us youngsters in the legal profession. Thank you very much, Justice Pal, for joining me today. You're very welcome. So let's start at the very beginning, which mm. is always a good place to start. Mm. Mm. Many of our listeners may not know that you did your undergraduate law degree from Nagpur. Correct. Which is, of course, now back in the news, given the fact that the current Chief Justice of India, Justice Bob Day, mm. also is from Nagpur. Mm. So tell us a little bit about how those days were in Nagpur. Well, I was admitted. I graduated from Shantiniketan with philosophy honors. And uh, uh, then I, for various reasons, I went down to Nagpur because my brother was there. Shankar Ghosh and uh, so while I was there I was not doing anything very much uh, because with the degree in law I had nothing very much to do and uh, so he said why don't you read law which the college was just down the street so I went to take admission in the law college and the principal was Janardhan Rao S. Janardhan Rao opposed my becoming a uh, to study in in the law class. Because you were a woman? Because I was a woman. He said that no woman had ever done a class in uh, public before. And they they used to take their examinations privately. So there were women, but... No, there were no women. There were no women at all. There was one old lady and there was another young girl, but they joined after I had joined. And which year was this? This was in 1960... Two sixty three, right. So, uh, so I had graduated. I graduated pretty young, and I was only nineteen when I graduated. So this was nineteen sixty two, sixty three. Correct. And there were no women in Nagpur Law College. College, yes. And so, uh, coming from a background of Vishwabharati, where there was no distinction made on the basis of gender, I uh, fought vigorously against this exclusion and I insisted on sitting in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So I initially when I should sit in the classroom the entire bench next to me used to be empty. (laughs) And then they compromised by giving me a small table and chair next to the lecturer. And so I should sit there and everyone else used to sit there. Initially uh, it was a little embarrassing because uh, every time they talked about, say, uh, Evidence Act and mm. rape law, they turned to me and say, with the permission of Miss Ghosh. <laughs> so that was uh, one of the uh, downsides of uh, sitting by myself. And the permission was duly granted. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I. But that must have also been quite hard. Uh, you're making light of it, given the fact that now you've gone through it and you can look back on it with a certain degree of fondness. But mm. uh, I can scarcely imagine as to how it must have been to be uh, an only woman mm. sitting publicly for the mm. first time in a mm. group of men who mm. perhaps don't think very much of your Yes, abilities. in fact, they question my uh, ability because they used to take my uh, one of the one of the students who was with me, a person called Lakshminath, who's since become a professor, and he's still, I'm still in touch with him. And um, he uh, went to the teacher and said that, uh, how is it that she's getting more marks? Is it because she's a woman? And the uh, uh, lecturer said, I'm giving you uh, her answer paper. You have a look at it and if you feel, it was on section 11 of the Evidence Act, Mm -hmm. if you feel that the answer is uh, um, less than or or should have been more than Mm -hmm. what uh, was expected, then um, if you think it was better than yours or worse than yours, then you 
uh, tell me accordingly. So, hmm. in fact, Lakshminath gave me that answer paper uh, again in Delhi when I was in the Supreme Court. I see. Hmm. So, you looked back upon it hmm. after hmm. a gap of four decades. Hmm. So, for three years, is there any particular incidents that you remember from your time there that still stays with you? Whether it's Yes, it is my spectacles. What about them? You see, the, the university was holding an intercollegiate badminton championship. Okay. And I could barely hold a badminton racket. And they said that they weren't being able to enter into the intercollegiate uh, badminton championship unless they had uh, women also uh, playing in the mixed doubles. So I went there and there was a chap called Arun Khanna who was a champion yeah, badminton player at that, at that time. And he uh, hit a shot across the net and I turned around to look at it and he flicked it right into my eye. I never used to, the shuttlecock hit me in my right eye. And so I got what was called an induced cataract. Okay. So I was under treatment for a long time. And in fact, at one point in time, my mother thought that I would lose my eye, but I didn't. Okay, well, I'm glad that that didn't that worked out all right at the end. Uh, but you went from Nagpur to Oxford. Now, that must have been quite a change. Hmm. I don't know how it would have been being a woman in Oxford at that time. Hmm. But was it very different from Nagpur or were there some fundamental similarities in the way in which women were treated? Well, we were 19 of us studying for the BCL. And I was the only woman again. Even in Oxford in 1965 yes, yes, yes. or 66? Yes. And um, Dyson Hayden, you heard of him. The high Australian court High Court Australia. judge. Yeah. He got the top, uh, the congratulatory first right. when we were there. And Rupert Hart was there. Rupert Cross was there. Hmm. Italy Hart was there. Hmm. But Dyson Hayden was your classmate. Contemporary, yes. That's right. Hmm. But how was it like being a woman in Oxford? Was it same as being a, the only woman in the law college in Nagpur? No, it was different in the sense that everyone used to pair off hmm. uh, for uh, tutorials. Hmm. And, I, and no one paired with me. But I had the privilege, at least, of having the singular attention of the tutor. <laughs> <laughs> but no, dis no real discrimination? Not otherwise. No? None at all, except racial. Oh. Racial discrimination there was a lot. That's right. Mm. So, let's come that back. That was the time of Enoch Powell and all That's that. Right. Rivers of blood mm. and so on. Let's, uh, let's come back to legal education. Mm. In India, we still have about 60,000 approximately, give or take a few, mm. law graduates who ostensibly are eligible to join the bar every mm. year. Mm. This includes the traditional law colleges mm. like Nagpur and also the newer ones like mm. the national law mm. schools. Mm. Uh, but at the same time, we see that legal academia in India hasn't mm. grown, mm. especially since you were a judge. Mm. You would have noted that there isn't that much legal scholarship that is quoted by the Indian Supreme Court, mm. Indian legal scholarship. Mm. There's a lot of foreign mm. legal scholarship uh, mm. that's quoted by the court, certainly not as much as mm. the cases in the mm. UK and the US. Mm. What do you think can be done to improve legal academia in India, given that you've had a taste of both what it's like in India and mm. what it's like mm. abroad? Mm. Well... Um... I think that more people should be encouraged to write. Yes, maybe there's room to write mm. more. Mm. But how do you think the uh, interface between the judiciary and academia can be improved? Because the fact is that we often find that judges do come and give lectures, not mm. very fine mm. lectures as mm. in law colleges. Mm. But there isn't a constant interface between mm. academia and and the judiciary, mm. as we see in some other countries. When mm. I was in Oxford, for example, every week we had a judge mm. uh, who would come and... Mm. Huffman used to teach us evidence. That's right. Mm. And 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 used to almost deal with you as an equal. Mm. And, mm. and in India, 
maybe judges do come mm. but maybe it's there are exceptions of course but maybe mm. it's not the same mm. how do you think we can academia can uh, in in a way raise its game so that it can be of more use to the judiciary and the development of jurisprudence in the country well i think for one when the judges are uh, appointments are being made they should look at uh, academicians yes yeah, so appointments i think that's a very valid point because mm. the, for the, at least for the supreme court mm, mm. article 124 allows mm. a distinguished jurist to mm, be appointed mm. why do you think we haven't had a single distinguished jurist being appointed till date i don't know i think because you have so many judges in the line so to speak mm. waiting to be appointed but you were in the collegium you didn't mm. make a push for any jurist to be appointed did well, you well at that point i had you know naina kapoor sakshi no uh, of the um, vishakha that's right okay ah. hmm. but we still haven't mm. and we are we still hopeful that there will be mm. will be some from the fraternity i think that would be an excellent way mm. of of increasing that interface mm. after all mm. justice felix frankfurter mm. one of the finest mm. judges of the american supreme court mm. after all was an mm. academic and there are many mm. many more mm. so so let's come to a contentious question which mm. you raised mm. a point was mm. in your very famous tarkunde memorial mm. lecture you had called judicial appointments through the collegium as one of the best kept secrets in the country mm. chief justice bobde has taken office and has shown a welcome streak of transparency in talking to the media in being open about what needs to be done in the judiciary What well, do you there think there was a time when no judge used to speak to the media That's right and I think times have changed and judges have changed with the times especially after the press conference by the justices I think we now live in changed times whether better or worse is a different mm-hmm. question but coming back to the question on appointments what do you think needs to be done constructively we've had a lot of criticism of collegium appointments and I have also been uh responsible for quite a bit of that criticism but constructively since it seems like the collegium is here to stay what needs to be done to ensure that the country gets the best people as it stretches well for 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 one thing you should start off the disciplinary proceedings in the collegium more strictly against your colleagues mm. if you find that your colleagues uh, you know need to be impeached Mm. you have the gumption to to say that he needs to be impeached mm. that is not done but that is a prerogative of parliament under but article 124 you can 124. refer it you can refer it to parliament for impeachment proceedings that's right and you Isn't think it? that this would be uh, an important step of course i think you raise a very valid point which is that there needs to be disciplinary proceedings against judges mm. who have been found to be engaging in behavior which is non judge like mm. and one of the problems that i point out in my book which i have written mm. and which you have read is that or hopefully read is that there is no mechanism apart from impeachment mm. by which judges can be disciplined mm. so do you think that perhaps the collegium needs to have measures or mm. chief justices of high court you do course. have you do have uh rules of conduct which have been set up isn't it quite apart from the bangalore principles so there is have, you have the uh, what is the judicial restatement of so there is a uh, restatement of values of judicial mm, life mm, together mm, with an in house procedure mm, mm. but the in house procedure is so opaque mm. that uh, we don't know really whether mm, actually mm. any disciplinary mechanisms mm. are being uh, implemented mm. so do you think that given the fact that what has happened de facto mm. is that in several cases inconvenient judges are transferred mm. from one high court mm. to another mm. now that it seems to me is some kind of very practical response mm. perhaps not entirely justified but a practical response to a different problem which is that there are no tools to mm. discipline judges in the us for example certainly in the lower judiciary as it you can uh, you can issue a public censure you can issue a mm-hmm. private censure mm-hmm. you can uh, pass an order for stoppage mm-hmm. of judicial work 
all of which can be done and is done by statute. Do you think that in India such a statute or a resolution is necessary? Yes. Why not? So there was a judicial standards and accountability legislation which sought to give power to a commission much later on, but primarily to judges to discipline their own. But do you think that it's a it's a practicable proposal given the fact that judges so far have seemed quite reluctant to mm. discipline their own. Quite right. And that's the whole problem, actually. That they are, in fact, uh, however well-intentioned they may be, that I want to clean up the system. But ultimately, they, when it comes down to the ground, they very rarely carry it out. That's right. So, in your experience, mm. and you've been a judge first in the Calcutta High mm. Court and then in the Supreme Court mm. for a mm. long period of time, mm. do you think that the lawyers mm. in some sense need to be uh, brought into this conversation mm. around judicial reform? Mm. What mm. is the role that you think the bar ought to play? Well, the bar, the, the members of the bar are supposed to be officers of court. And they certainly don't act like officers of the court. They go on strike. Uh, they, uh, and they don't realize that the only way in which litigants can approach the courts are through the lawyers. I mean, the, the, the judges don't look at the litigants. They look at the lawyers who represent the litigants. Now, if the, uh, if the lawyers are on strike, then the uh, access to justice is denied. They don't, uh, the, the, uh, the litigants don't have access to justice. Yeah. And yet you have uh, lawyers going on strike every so often. Mm. So, what can we, so what can we do about this? Because this seems to me to be a shambolic state of affairs. Mm. That lawyers who are essentially... Are perhaps the only profession which has monopoly over a state function, that is mm. justice delivery. Mm. You can only get justice through mm. a lawyer mm. approaching mm. Uh, a court for mm. your case. Mm. But lawyers can hold the entire system to ransom yes, that's by because, going on strike yes. for some piddling issue. Yes, that's because the Bar Council of India is very ineffective. Before, the disciplinary jurisdiction was with the judges. That's right. They had the disciplinary jurisdiction. They used to refer matters to the Bar Council. This is before the Advocates Act. Yes. Mm. And then when the disciplinary jurisdiction was taken away from them and given to the Bar Council of India, then the Bar Council of India was proved to be totally ineffective in dealing with these issues. And the last time I had the opportunity of looking at the facts and figures, I found that so many cases which are pending which had not, in fact, been disposed of. That's right. So, as in, this is something that we found in a lot of our research, that the biggest impediment to judicial reforms in the country mm. to make our courts work faster mm. is not judges or vacancies mm. in judges, mm. it's actually lawyers. Mm. And the constant demand for adjournments, apart from, of mm. course, this entirely uh, unwarranted and unjustifiable going mm. on strike. Mm. Now, take, uh, take the example of the Jammu Bar. Mm. The Jammu Bar was on strike for about 44, 45 mm. days mm. because pursuant to Article 370 being nullified, mm. Mm. courts in Jammu and Kashmir lost their jurisdiction mm. to register documents. Now, mm. everywhere in the country, document mm. registration mm. happens through e-stamps that mm. you can do mm. in every nook and corner. Mm. But it was a peculiarity of the Jammu and Kashmir constitution that only courts had that ability. Mm. And because it was taken away, and mm. also, and this is certainly, we can have different views on 370, but this is certainly a good consequence mm. that people mm. could get their revenue documents mm. registered mm. anywhere. Mm. But the bar went on mm, strike for 40 mm, days. Mm, and, and I believe that the Chief Justice Gita Mittal mm, had to issue, take Suomoto contempt action mm, against them. So do you mm, think contempt action is a, perhaps a way forward for striking lawyers? Well, it puts the judges in confrontation with the lawyers. Mm. That's the whole point. Are you going to carry out the contempt proceedings? That's the whole point. So do you think it's a real threat? I don't think it's a real threat because uh, uh, how will they, I mean, they will come and justify their, their action. Uh, 
uh, or they will be seen, the, the chief justice will be seen as being politically motivated. So it's a tough one. It's, it's a, a tough, tough one as in if lawyers don't have fidelity to their profession mm-hmm. as officers of the court, mm-hmm. I think there is very little that mm-hmm. we can do. Mm-hmm. But you spoke about a, as in a, a, a much older time mm-hmm. when uh, the high courts regulated the legal profession. Mm-hmm. One of the other things that was there was a cap on lawyer fees Mm. that used to exist. Yes, that is no longer there. That is certainly not there. And that is actually from the point of view of the litigant. Mm. One of the major reasons as to why no one wants to approach a court. Supreme Court. Because it's expensive. Particularly the Supreme Court. And then you have, you have, first of all, the expenses of, of going from here, paying for your lawyer to go to Delhi. And then you, know, they have to, you know, make arrangements here, take their own lawyer to Delhi, and then only to have it mentioned and adjourned. That's right. So do you think perhaps, and this is a provocative and perhaps a very unpopular suggestion, but do you think that maybe we should restart a conversation around capping lawyer fees? Hmm. Well, I think certainly should think so, but that is because the lawyers in Delhi have built up a monopoly. So you have even the Tisazari lawyers appearing in the Supreme Court. Mm. So perhaps this is an idea. For mentioning. That's right. So perhaps this is a question of decentralization, something that the Attorney General, Mr. Venugopal, mm. keeps talking about, that perhaps we should have more circuit benches. A national all court of appeal India. in four, four parts mm. of the country. Mm. And actually, very interestingly, as I found that in the first Supreme Court, uh, Justice Meherchan Mahajan, mm. when he was a puny judge, mm. was sent by Chief Justice Kaniya mm. to Hyderabad. Mm. And there was a bench of the Supreme Court which mm. functioned in Hyderabad mm. with Meherchan Mahajan, mm. the Chief Justice of the High mm. Court and another puny judge mm. who were appointed ad hoc judges mm. to dispose of a large set of appeals mm. which were pending before the Privy Council in Hyderabad. I see. So it was an inter- it's not like it hasn't happened mm-hmm. before. Mm-hmm. It has happened. And I think mm-hmm. that perhaps we need to think about creative solutions. Mm-hmm. So let's come to creative solutions before we end. Mm-hmm. So there are a number of challenges before the judiciary. Mm-hmm. What do you think are the one or two key reforms that needs to be brought about by the Chief Justice of India? I think the collegium system should be made more transparent. <laughs> Uh, the system of interviewing judges from the high court should go because it is a farce. Uh, if the chief justice of the high court has, uh, um, has recommended someone's name, they should in fact accept that name without calling for this um, interview. Why interview judges? Mm. Why is it necessary? You should accept that the High Court Chief Justice has in his wisdom recommended certain names. And on the basis of the record as sent, you should appoint. But even in the UK Supreme Court now, there is interviewing of judges that state, potential that because, judges that Yes, state, that is because... Together with an application. Yes, that is because now the Supreme Court in, in the UK, you don't, you no longer have, you have people who have come from civil services, from local magistracies, and everywhere they've opened it all up. It's a small country. Come on, it's not get to Brexit now. <laughs> yeah, okay. I think we certainly don't want to get into Brexit here. So one is about appointments, and what do we do about delays? This is the problem that affects the common man and woman. Well, as long as you have don't have a necessary number of judges, although the number of judges has gone up enormously, but as we said earlier, and you have, you should have. Uh, <clears throat> circuit benches or more benches operating in four parts of India and have more appointments to the Supreme Court operating in these four places, uh, you'll always have delays. That's right. Because unless you just stop litigating. That's right. So let me end with a more personal question. You you had a a run in the Supreme Court which was widely applauded by the by the bar in the mm. Supreme Court. And a lot of people, maybe this is a strange compliment, but in our patriarchal society is perhaps a, a real compliment, mm. said that you were the only man I in know. the Supreme Court. I know. I always resented that. I know you resented that. But how do you think we can get a more diverse Supreme Court? Mm. 
guys by getting more women on the bench and when do you think there will be enough well i don't think till till all of them are in fact as someone said in the supreme court when all nine judges are uh, in the supreme court of the us when all nine judges i think ruth 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 wade and ruth wade ginsburg said all nine judges are women only then will we be satisfied well i think that should be a complete answer to your question Well, thank you very much, Justice Paul, for joining us. I think we have a long way to go before we get all 34 women judges in India's Supreme Court. But maybe that day will also come. Thanks very much for joining. Time for clatter. Our legal quiz that's a bit tougher than clat. We had an easy question last time. The answer was. Gina Miller the litigant in the Brexit case of Indian origin and many of you got the right answer the first one to get it was Ramesh KC well done Ramesh and Amazon gift voucher awaits now time for today's quiz when this act was passed it was stated that the three reasons for passing this act were health measures humanitarian grounds and eugenic grounds but the committee that had recommended the passage of the act said that the overriding ground was avoiding grave injury to mental and physical health which act of parliament are we talking about uh, just a clue it is an act of the parliament of india do write in to justify at vidhi legal policy dot in all right answers go into a pool and the winner gets a gift voucher from amazon thanks very much for tuning in to our republic day special till next time adjourn if you enjoyed listening to this podcast follow us on twitter at vidhi underscore india for regular updates follow us on apple podcast google podcast or any other podcast channel that you know to tune in to our next episode email us at justify at vidhi legal policy dot in to share your comments and feedback on this episode we look forward to hearing from you